Alrighty. Good morning, folks on Zoom. Okay. Yes. Yep. So we're going to finish chapter two today. There's another assignment y'all are going to do as a group. Um, so we've got plenty of time here. All righty. So we were up to talking about the problem solving ports. I'm gonna go ahead and get our captions on. So I'll have a little bit of lecture today, and then we'll, like I said, we'll have another assignment where we'll talk about judges and problem solving ports and all that fun stuff. Oh, hang on just one sec, guys. This is my daughter's school, so. Uh -huh. Oh my God. Um, let me call my husband real quick because I'm just about to start teaching class. So I think he should be able to go get her. Uh -huh. Bye bye. All righty, guys. Just going to call my hubby real quick here. This is real life. <laughs> hey, Quinn's running a fever. Can you go get her? All right. Thanks. Love you. Bye. That was easy. <laughs> All right, <laughs> now we can really teach. If you know, if it's not one thing, it's another. Um, and that kind of relates to actually what we're going to be talking about with problem solving courts, which are often dealing with sort of family issues and other personal issues for folks. So, um, problem solving courts are created by communities to help troubled individuals cope with the problems that brought them to court in the first place. This approach in which the law is used as a vehicle to improve people's lives instead of being punitive uh, is called therapeutic jurisprudence. Fancy way of saying we're trying to help people instead of hurt uh, or punish them. Examples of these problem-solving courts are here on the screen. They include drug courts, mental health courts, homeless courts, and domestic violence courts. And many characteristics of these particular types of courts are, um, you know, sort of unconventional. They're not going to look like your typical corporate. So, for example, the clients are able to speak directly to the judge, which is very distinct from like a criminal court where it's usually the lawyers. Um, and then, you know, there are other things that are different depending on the type of problem solving court. So drug courts, maybe not surprisingly, uh, were created to deal with offenders whose crimes are related to addiction in particular. This is one of the big problems that stemmed from the war on drugs. So I'm thinking no one in this room was probably alive in the 80s. I was. Um, and this was a big thing in the Reagan era. We're going to declare a war on drugs and we're going to, this is our biggest enemy. And the problem is, yes, some people who are involved in using and trafficking drugs are doing it just purely for financial gain. But a lot of people who get mixed up within that system are actually um, having problematic addictions, which is a mental and physical health disorder, right? So we're, <laughs> what problems of, or drug courts in particular as a problem solving court recognizes that we have been punishing people very severely for a crime that's related to a disorder they have. Um, now, does this say, you know, you should be able to ruin people, other people's lives with drugs? No. Uh, certainly the opioid crisis and the lawsuits that are starting to come about against the drug companies are really showing that <laughs> the American court system says, no, you shouldn't be able to ruin people's lives with drugs, right? But this is really focusing in on those people, right, whose lives have been changed by substances. Um, 
I don't know how familiar y'all are with what happens with most drug offenders in this country. They often get longer sentences than like people who attack someone, right? Um, people who sexually assault someone. Uh, and it's because there are these mandatory minimum sentences that aren't flexible. President Biden has worked on some of this. So he did commute the sentences of a whole bunch of nonviolent drug offenders but we really need changes to the laws to make that a difference going forward. Um, the US in general has 20% of the world's prison population, uh, which is really problematic. Um, I think it's like five people in every 1,000 in the US is incarcerated uh, and nowhere else in the world is that, you know, near that. Um, and so drug courts are one step to trying to solve that basically. So rather than, put these people in prison, we are saying, how can we help them instead? Um, so they offer treatment programs instead of, again, throwing people in prison where sometimes drugs are more readily available because people have contraband, right? Um, and they uh, also offer supervision to drug addicted offenders. So there might be someone within the court system that person has to check in with that holds them accountable, right? Um, in exchange for a successful completion of the program, the court may dismiss the original charge, uh, reduce or set aside a sentence, assign some lesser penalty. So maybe instead of serving time, you pay a fine uh, or are on probation uh, or some combination of those things. So how successful are these courts at their intended purposes of helping to reduce drug-related criminal activity while trying to help people who struggle with addiction. The findings, unfortunately, are mixed. So graduates of these drug courts were about a third less likely to be rearrested on subsequent drug charges than similar defendants in traditional court. Um, even a third is good, right? Uh, but it's certainly less success than we would like to see, obviously. And evidence suggests that even some serious violent offenders can be helped by drug courts. So there is evidence that suggests that even the people we would think of as like the bad guys, right, the violent drug dealers can be helped, especially if they themselves are struggling with issues of addiction. Um, so that's something that's really positive. Mental health courts, what the name implies, they were developed for offenders dealing with severe mental illness or serious mental illness. Sometimes you'll see in the literature, this is abbreviated as SMI. So I was just talking about this in my adult psychopathology class last week. Um, so what happened in the US is we used to have state hospitals, uh, funded hospitals that if you had a severe mental illness, you would essentially go there and live there the rest of your life. Now, these were not always great places, right? There was definitely abuse, neglect, people were locked into padded rooms, things along those lines. Um, and so in the 70s, there was reform and people said, these places are horrible, let's get rid of them. And so this is referred to as deinstitutionalization, getting rid of these institutions where people used to be institutionalized. Um, and so this is the trend of closing those mental health hospitals. And that has left a lot of mentally ill individuals who otherwise would have had access to services or medication without those. And again, I'm not saying we should go back to the abusive system that existed previously, but I'm saying we've left these people high and dry. Yeah. Isn't that like kind of similar? Yeah. Exactly. And people are trying to figure that out. And the problem is it's like, I mean, not that I'm at all knocking nonprofits and the great work they did do, but it's like individual nonprofits rather than like the federal government trying to solve what's clearly a national problem, right? Um, yeah, no, totally. And that a lot of those folks who would have been institutionalized previously are now um, homeless. And again, it doesn't mean that everyone who's homeless has a mental health issue, 
It doesn't mean that everyone with a severe mental illness ends up homeless, right? But what happens is a lot of times people who have, let's say, schizophrenia, that's like one of the severe mental illnesses we often think about, experience what's called downward drift, which is typically, although my generation or your generation, I don't know how it's going to go, but typically each generation does better than their parents. Um, the people with severe mental illness, particularly psychosis like schizophrenia, uh, will actually do worse off than their parents, and they call that downward drift. So if you can't find a job, right, then you can't pay rent. And if you can't pay rent, then you don't have a place to live, and you may become homeless if you don't have family to support you. Or even if you do have family to support you, but they're limited in their financial resources, right, which happens, unfortunately, as well. So... Mentally ill have experienced, uh, people who are mentally ill, sorry, <laughs> have experienced high rates of homelessness, unemployment. Uh, they also end up being susceptible to alcohol and drug use, um, and then physical and sexual abuse as well, whether on the streets or again in poor shelter environments, which can exist. And many with severe mental illnesses are incarcerated because they end up in trouble with the law again, just as we just talked about with drugs and alcohol, right? If they are using or abusing substances, they can end up with those mandatory minimum sentences. And if the offender is diverted from the regular criminal courts to a mental health court, then they get radically different treatment. So there's actually a mental health team that's assigned to them and they'll prepare a treatment plan that the goal is to lead to long-term psychiatric care and reintegration into society so that that person can find a job down the road and things along those lines. And if the offender follows that treatment plan, the charges are dismissed. So again, this keeps people with mental illness out of the prison system. Not only is this good for those people, but to be perfectly honest, it also saves money, right? Uh, mental health care is not cheap, <laughs> uh, particularly any job within the prison system, you get paid more because it's hard to get people to work there. So for just give you an example. So when I did my um, residency, my clinical internship that's required to get your PhD in psychology, uh, I worked at a, a consortium with a VA and a medical center, and I think I made like 22 grand for the year. Not great, but it was Augusta, Georgia, so I could afford to live on it. Um, I believe this was back in like 2010 or 20, 2009 when I was looking. I believe the federal prison ones were advertising $50,000, so like double what I was making. Um, so, which is great for the people who work there, but also it's sort of taking into account hazard pay that occasionally there are people who are dangerous, but also the stress, right, of working within that environment. Yeah, Elijah. Um, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's why you're paid more, um, but it means that it's expensive. And so it means that if you can save money that way, it saves the prison system money. Yeah. yeah but there's a lot of that has been putting recently because of the amount of inmates that yeah. they are supposedly assigned to, like, um, one had to quit because they tried to assign him almost 20 people and he's like, I can't even do care like that because right. that's not fair for them. Yeah, I'm going to try and find real quick the article about the psychiatrist in the Norfolk prison system. Uh, now you get to see my really haphazard uh, Googling skills where I'm just like, psychiatrist prison, Norfolk, let's see if you give me anything. There we go. Um, <laughs> we got it. Um, and so, yeah, this was just May of last year. Um, and it was the Norfolk City Jail psychiatrist resigned uh, amid what he described as rampant prescri prescription drug abuse fueled by the excessive distribution of medications to inmates. Um, he was a contractor, only worked on the job six months. Um, when he came in, more than a third of the inmate population was on some sort of medication. He was cutting it. Um, and the sheriff's office had him meet a quota that basically said, 
you can only spend 10 minutes or less with each person. Even like a regular outpatient med check is usually 20 to 30. Um, and that's not someone who's in a very stressful situation, typically like a prison setting. Um, and these violate psychiatric standards by not allowing enough time for accurate diagnosis or determine what medication was needed. Uh, and so he said it was unethical and dangerous. And of course the sheriff's office was like, oh, I didn't do that. Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, and so this is a person who had another job um, and so this was a contract job for nine hours a week where he was supposed to see 300 patients <laughs> in that 900 or nine hours a week, right? Um, and so that's just not possible. Um, and so he said nurses and guards are telling him that the inmates were hoarding, crushing, and abusing their prescription medication. There are prescription medications for mental health that can be abused, so things like Adderall. Right, um, it's basically prescription meth. You know, it's much more regulated, obviously, but so you can get high off it. There is a black market for it, um, and you know, even antidepressants as well. Hi, I don't need your ad. Okay, close. Um, so basically, he sort of intimated that these people were being. Um, you know, over medicated. And this can happen. Um, it's very similar to like an elementary school classroom. How, you know, and this was a big thing in the 80s and 90s where like a whole bunch of kids who probably didn't have ADHD ended up on ADHD meds because if you're a teacher with a class of 30 plus kids, right, we're asking teachers to do too much uh, and a kid is distracting, um, it becomes problematic. So, um, you know, just saying jail is hard. I get that, but I can't medicate the entire jail. That also just speaks to our jail and prison system, right? And like, there's probably ways that we can make it more livable. I know it's punitive, but it doesn't have to be unlivable without medication, right? So they wanted him to see 50 inmates per week in the nine hours he was contracted to work. Um, that's impossible. Like, to be perfectly honest, you can't even see that many patients if you're doing like a full work week. That's a lot. Um, so that's way too many. So um, he said, you want me to go fast, but I won't do it at the risk of misdiagnosis. That'll lead to malpractice. And I think more than that, just like the ethics of like making sure you get people's diagnoses correct and you're treating them properly. Yeah. So like when looking at the text that they went through like the different ethical guidelines mm -hmm. that all the different branches are based on the proper. Yep. How would like that not be any ethical? Yeah, and so here is where mental health professionals come into conflict with the legal system, right? Because I'm sure he is following the guidelines of the psychiatry profession, which you know. They're appearing to medical guidelines, but then there are more specific ones for psychiatrists, right? And they're probably very similar. I've never actually read them myself, but I'm guessing they're very similar to ours for psychologists because I've looked at like the ones for counselors and they're almost identical, right? So yeah, this is where his ethics come into violation with people working outside of the mental health field who want to like tell him what to do. And this is not unique to a prison setting, I will say. Anytime you're working in a setting where the people above you are not mental health professionals, uh, you can run into this, where they ask you to do things and you say, this violates my ethical boundaries. Sometimes this happens even when you are working with someone. Uh, I'll give you an example. When I was on my residency, my, I was doing family therapy, um, and my supervisor said, okay, I want you to see the family one week and then the adolescent by herself the next week. That's a violation. That's a dual relationship because you're not supposed to be someone's individual therapist and then also treat the family because then your alliance, your allegiance is always to that individual. And if you're the family therapist, your allegiance should be to the conflict between the family members. Um, but I was basically forced to do it. 
Uh, and I told her, I'm like, this violates my ethical principles. And she said, well, this is the reality of working in a small town. And it just felt really weird, right? Yeah, so this is these are things, and I was a trainee at that point, so I couldn't really say no. Um, she was writing me letters of recommendation so I could, you know, get this job. Um, but I, you know, if I were asked to do it now, I'd just be like, no, <laughs> right, if I were practicing. Uh, because, you know, especially if I was at the same point in my career in an academic medical setting that I am here, like right now I'm a tenured full professor. So I'd be like, what are you going to do, fire me? You can't unless I violate the law. And you're kind of asking me to violate my ethics, right? Uh, that's very much how I've become here at Wesleyan. Like, what are you going to do, fire me? You can't. And also, I won the teaching award six years ago. So maybe you should just let me teach the way I know how to teach. I don't know. Sorry, y'all didn't need that rant. Um, <laughs> you know, this happens anywhere that you are. That You're sometimes asked to do things that violate your ethics and then you have to choose whether you're going to go along with it or stand up. This person could because they already had another source of income, right? Um, if this was a young trainee, this is their first job, you know, maybe right out of getting licensed, they would have less power to stand up. And so this becomes very tricky. Um, I think sort of in this day and age, it, it's easier to do because mental health is so needed, you will find another job, right? Uh, but certainly say when I was on the job market, that would have been really difficult because it was really hard to get a job um, because I was on the job market like right after the housing bubble crashed and a bunch of people were like, canceling job searches because the like, university would throw the funding and things like that so yeah so the economics can also influence it which it shouldn't right <laughs> and certainly that happens throughout the court system as well I mean one of the things that I think I mentioned previously is people who are rich often do better in the system because they can afford better lawyers and those lawyers can afford to hire consultants like a psychologist right um, whereas if you just have a public defender, depending on your jurisdiction, John Oliver did a really good segment on this a couple of years back. And it was like, they have like 12 minutes essentially to work on each case. So very similar to the psychiatrist, uh, scenario where that's clearly not enough time to do a good defense of someone. Yeah. So those are the mental health courts. Um, and they have been somewhat effective in getting participants into treatment service and reduce, reducing recidivism. One of the problems that happens, however, and this is anytime you're asking someone to make a change, the person has to want to get better, right? Um, <laughs> back in the day for like a season or two, Tim Gunn from Project Runway had his own show, which is called Tim Gunn's Guide to Style. And he used to say to the people he worked with, I can't want this for you more than you want this for yourself. And that's so true in the therapy situation. If that client is not prepared to change, um, they might not cooperate in treatment or they might be trying to cooperate, but it's just not working. And so you, they really have to buy in in order for that change to happen. So those are the mental health courts. And then obviously, as we talked about, those are gonna be interrelated with the drug courts and with, unfortunately, the homelessness courts. So these are courts that aim to reduce homelessness by dealing with things like landlord and tenant issues and addressing the underlying causes of homelessness, like mental illness, like lack of job skills, like language barriers. Um, and the result here is a reduction in low-level crime and decreased recidivism by offenders. I mean, this goes back to my silly Jean Valjean example, right, from Les Mis, that like sometimes people are stealing just so they can feed themselves. Like, I don't know if anyone else saw <laughs> these posts during the pandemic, but I know a lot of frontline workers at like grocery stores were like, if you steal diapers, no, you didn't. <laughs> like, I didn't see it. Because uh, people just recognize people are trying to like feed and take care of their families. Domestic violence courts have coordinated efforts to hold perpetrators accountable, enhance victim and child safety, 
and promote informed judicial decision making. Now, one thing I'll say real quick here is that the legal system is going to use the term victim uh, because that tracks with all the other crimes, like a victim of murder. Many people who are victims of domestic violence prefer to be called survivors. Um, and so outside of the legal context, that's usually the term I will use. Um, but in this case, they're referred to as victims, so I will use that language. Um, and they provoke, again, this informed judicial, judicial decision making. Um, a lot of people don't realize all the things that happen environmentally, sociologically, even in your brain when you are in a situation of domestic violence. Like there is brain-based evidence that shows that like when you are attacked, your brain actually kind of like shuts down in this very different way that makes it hard for you to remember the facts in order. We also know that the perpetrators tend to purposely isolate their victims, their survivors. Um, when I teach GWSS 219, there's a great activity that Dr. Stoley will come in and do with my students uh, where everybody gets a like role um, and uh, one person plays the victim and everybody has like a piece of yarn that connects them to the victim. And the victim just goes to each person and says, can you help me? And everybody has a reason why they can. Like you married him, you got yourself into this or sorry, the domestic violence shelter is full, things like that. And so you cut the string and so eventually the only string is the one connecting her to the abuser, right? So you just really see how isolated it can get. We also know that the most dangerous time in any domestic violence situation is when you try to leave. That's when you're most likely to be killed. And again, these to me, as someone who studies psychology and gender studies, seem really obvious, but a lot of people don't understand that, right? And so the people who are involved in these domestic violence courts will have the education, the judges, the lawyers, what have you, on those issues. So they involve spe specially trained judges and staff, coordination among community resources, and close monitoring of the perpetrator both before and after case disposition. But they also differ from other problem solving courts in important respects. So they start from the premise that the offender's behavior is learned rather than rooted in something that's a treatable illness. Um, the vast majority of people who commit domestic violence were victims of domestic violence themselves, often when they were growing up. Uh, so it's sort of like to them, this makes sense, even though to the rest of us, it doesn't necessarily, right? So the court proceedings are primarily adversarial rather than therapeutic for that reason. So both victims and perpetrators have expressed satisfaction with domestic court processes and outcomes. And compared with traditional courts, domestic violence courts process cases faster and have higher rates of guilty pleas. In addition, perpetrators are more likely to comply with the judge ordered conditions than in a traditional court setting. Now, there are criticisms of the problem solving courts, as you might expect. One is that threatening punishment to coerce someone into rehabilitation is unfair, uh, at least, but also in some cases just not feasible, right? As I mentioned, like the person has to buy in for it to really work. And if they're only doing it to avoid going to prison, it's gonna be less effective in some cases. Um, also, guilt and innocence is not being determined by a traditional trial, and so some people have an issue with that. And then prosecutors often feel pressure to favor re rehabilitation of the offender, sometimes over the protection of the society. And defenders feel pressured to plead their clients guilty and to inform the courts of clients' failure to comply with the terms of probation. So then, like, that feels weird because it feels like you're not on your client's side, right? Um, so that can be an issue in and of itself. Alrighty, so what we're gonna do now, actually let's talk about judges before we do the assignment because I think it'll help to set it up a little better. So uh, we're gonna talk about the players in the legal system and then our assignment is gonna talk about judges in particular. 
And so judges are an interesting bunch. <laughs> they are selected in a variety of ways. Um, so I think the ones we typically think of are uh, the appointed ones. So like at the federal level, the Supreme Court, a lot of federal courts, those are appointed and have to be like voted on by Congress. I think it's the Senate in particular. Um, but a lot of state court judges face elections. And in fact, where I grew up and where I initially started my like, young voter career in Michigan, we elected our judges. Um, and it was a little ludicrous, to be honest. I mean, like, that's great that there's like a, a democratic process for it, but it would be like, here's the list of people running for judge. Vote for no more than 18. And there were 18 people, right? <laughs> like it wasn't really like it was contested. Um, so it's interesting to think about in that way. Um, uh, and often in those scenarios, the governor will make an initial appointment and then the judge is retained or not after the popular election. If retained, they serve a number of years and then they run again. And judges tend to just stay in for all the reasons I just mentioned. Supporters say that this makes judges accountable to the public. A judge who makes unpopular decisions can be removed. This actually did happen in California after the Brock Turner case. So for people who aren't familiar with that case, this was a man who sexually assaulted a woman um, blatantly outside on a college campus. Uh, and he got, I believe, three months in prison. Um, and that judge, who only gave him three months because he didn't want to ruin this young man's life, was actually recalled. And so they voted him out of office. Uh, so that can happen. Um, judicial retention elections may invite pressure from special interest groups, however. So judges in particular are supposed to be apolitical, right? You're supposed to be just deciding on the side of the law. But again, especially if you look at things like the Supreme Court nominees, we know that they are political, right? And so that in and of itself can be an issue. Um, there's also concern that judicial elections may pose a threat to fairness and impartiality of the courts for that reason. Although I don't think that appointments necessarily <laughs> solve that as we've seen, unfortunately. Um, there are judges out there who will very clearly just decide based on the rule of law. Um, you know, and I think that honestly, uh, the chief Supreme Court justice right now really does that, um, at least with his interpretation of it. There are times he will vote against what you think, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, against what you think sort of like a conservative judge would do, but he's doing it based on, again, his interpretation of the constitution, as it exists. So I think that he has a little more of that vibe than some other judges do, which is interesting. So what influences judicial judgments? Maybe not surprisingly, until recently, federal judges were almost exclusively male and exclusively white. Uh, racial minorities were vastly underrepresented, and honestly, they still are. <laughs> we're getting better, but um, but the imbalance did begin to change with the presidencies of Jimmy Carter, uh, who appointed 20, well, I'll just say both here. Well, Jimmy Carter and President Clinton worked, Bill Clinton worked on this, where 21% of Carter's appointments were women and or minorities, and then for Clinton, almost half, 49% of his appointees were women and or um, minorities. So there are people who very consciously put this into place. Obviously, President Obama maintains that. President Biden has as well. When a Supreme Court seat opened up, he said very explicitly, it's going to be a black woman. And people were like, oh my God, how do you know they're qualified? And it's like, if you have a problem thinking how a black woman could be qualified for the Supreme Court, like you're asking the wrong question, maybe you should ask yourself some questions, right? Um, so there it has been efforts to make a change on this, but obviously still some more uh, way to go. Do judges rule differently if they're different genders? A study of 292 federal cases between 1981 and 1996 showed no effects of judges' gender or race on their decisions, which again is ideal 
if we're really deciding based on the letter of the law, right? Men and women, uh, whites and people of color judges were equally likely to rule in favor of the plaintiff, for example, in cases of sexual harassment. Okay, so then there's also appellate cases. In the legal model of decision-making, judges dispassionately considered the relevant laws, precedents, and constitutional principles. And in theory, as I keep saying, uh, judicial bias has no part in decision-making. In the attitudinal model of decision-making, judges favor the facts of the case in light of the ideological attitudes and values of the justices. And so I think sort of in modern times, we like to think that we're going with the legal model, but in a lot of cases, it's actually the attitudinal model that comes into play. So how do judges deliberate, make their decisions? And so models of human judgment, not surprisingly, apply to judges because they are human. Um, so they, in these models, distinguish between intuitive processes, which occur spontaneously, often without careful thought or effort, and deliberative processes that involve mental effort, concentration, motivation, and the application of rules. Judges have been shown, however, to use the intuitive decision process for things that are not as clearly spelled out. So things like damage awards. And so when someone sues, they might sue for, you know, $100 million. And the judge doesn't really have like a guideline to say like, is that realistic or not? So they use the intuitive process to decide what that reward should actually be. Um, also descriptions of litigants conduct and whether or not evidence should be admissible. They kind of do that based on an intuitive process as well. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and do our assignment. Um, so if you go to Blackboard under assignments, uh, there's the link there. Um, I will also throw it up here in the chat uh, for anyone who wants to look at it that way. Once I get the chat open, if you're a person who can write a whole bunch of letters real quick, you can go ahead and use that. Um, and so this is talking about judges in the legal system. And so there's a box here, very similar to the assignment we did on Tuesday, um, where you can read through the box and answer questions based on that. And then there's another judge we're going to talk about who I have a... Um, a quick link to an article to explain what happened to him. So let's go ahead and do you guys feel like moving around today? Can that be okay? No, okay. All right, I'll group you by where you're sitting. That's fine. All right, so let's have the three of y'all across, be your one. The three of y'all in the back here, be your two. You three can be your three, and then you three can be your four. And then I will put the folks on Zoom in a breakout room to be group five, but I also understand if like your tech isn't working and you can't talk to each other, um, but I will do that. So again, find your group's spot on the sheet uh, and answer the questions together. All right, and now I'm gonna create the breakout room now that I'm done talking. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, there's just not enough plugs in these rooms. Oh, it was charging before I left. Well, mine just stops charging. So, like, it will, if I haven't plugged in, it'll work, but it won't, like, char hold charge at all. So, it's really annoying. <laughs> so, I feel you. <laughs> And while y'all do that, I'm going to go blow my nose because for whatever reason, as much as I wear masks, they make my nose run.
Sorry. <laughs> no, that was holding me not loving. Hopefully I didn't mess it up. <laughs> Happy Groundhog Day, by the way. Because that's a thing. He saw his shadow, whatever that means. Before we start, I have a question. Yeah. Um, for the retractors, for the injury kit, mm -hmm. are they to be left the Monday before the retractor? Good question. So you're writing about the past week of injury. Mm -hmm. like the one, the first one that was due two days ago would have been make sure this last if that makes sense.
What's that? Oh, okay, I thought you were talking to me. <laughs> Hmm. Um, yeah. um, All right, looks like people are rolling, maybe need an extra minute or two, so we'll do that.
All righty, I'm going to bring back our breakout room folks, and then we will go ahead and start talking through everything. Okay. Okay, and I saw that I messed up and didn't delete the past names from group four. So good job finding group six to you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Alrighty, so uh, let's do the same thing we did last time, and we'll roll on through and have each group answer one question. And again, if other groups want to jump in and contribute, uh, you totally can. So. Um, all right, so we have this, I think like a really prime example of what how a mental health court can work, right? With this uh, example of Justice de Emick. Um, so group one, does this description fit with the ideas you have about what a judge does? I forget, were, were you guys group one or were y'all group one? Okay, perfect, so yeah. What did y'all think for the first question here? Um, I think that he is a good example because not a lot of judges take into account uh, like mental health. You know, they just like we created our family, we get a charge for our city, and that's the end of the story. But so I said no. Mm -hmm. I don't think his description does fit what I think of when I hear the word judge that's mm -hmm. not really what I see and like he went above and beyond even like giving out the personal number. Right, right. I mean that's something I was trained not to do as a therapist, right? And so I would imagine judges might have similar vibes, but you know, it made sense in this case. The guy only used it once. He didn't abuse it. And I thought it was so cute that he like called to ask the judge's opinion about like a major life crisis. I think you're getting married. What do you think? I thought that was adorable. Yeah, any other thoughts about Judge Justice to Emick here? Alrighty, group two, what do you think of this idea of therapeutic jurisprudence in general? Well, we kind of talked about how punishment has like a negative connotation and then therapeutic jurisprudence has like a positive connotation is more likely for people to be engaged in like a process where they're trying to help them get better instead of punishing them where they're like kind of disconnected from like what's happened. Yeah, yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And it's very distinct, right, from what we typically think of when we think of the justice system, right? Or even like, I don't know, for some reason when I said the justice system, it made me think of like that dawn of justice, right? It's sort of this vigilante idea of justice very distinct it's very different Alrighty, group three uh in what other ways do you think demographic variables or personal beliefs of judges affect judgments and do you see that as a negative or a positive um um, and I think that like, in this case, I feel like the judge is, um, but there is no guarantee that the judge is going to be able to refer them. But it is unorthodox for them to be sympathetic with mental illness. Mm -hmm. So I think that is really important that they provide us. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right on that, you know, this, this is unusual and um this is where that like instinctual right idea over the like more deliberative process comes into play where sometimes judges will just have like we can do better for you uh I don't know if anyone's seen the viral videos of I think the guy's a judge in like Brooklyn or something in parking court and he'll just be like what do you mean it was like a minute late and he'll talk to the guy about his life and dismiss the ticket um yeah they're just confused their humanity yeah Jasmine um, I wanted to say something about the previous question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think therapeutic jurisprudence is a concept that should be probably followed through the entire prison system because it shouldn't take a prisoner with mental health disability to have a certain level of step in humanity. 
The term is said not to coddle inmates, but to assist them by meeting some other needs of mental health care while they serve their time. Theoretically, it is a good concept, but in reality, it would be more harmful because it allows further abuse of other inmates. While not necessarily meeting the needs of inmates with the facility to allow the entire system. Yeah, I think that's such a good point is that, you know, sometimes what we forget is that inmates are going to be exposed to other inmates, right? Um, and this is can be one of the big issues of trying like teenagers as adults, right? Because then they will go into the adult prison system and you've got like a 16 year old kid with these hardened criminals um, and that can really influence them, obviously. And so some people go to prison and you know, make use of the resources and come out with like a college degree and have done really well. And some people unfortunately get like badly influenced while they're in there. Yeah, so I think that that's such a good point as well. Um, I'm gonna just like sneak a little peek here. Who got to what? It looks like group four is at least able to touch on question five. So uh, Michaela, I don't know if you're able to unmute uh, if you are, feel free to read your answer to the fourth question about judge role. Uh, what precautions should judge take to ensure their safety? And if you can't, I can read it for you. I can read mine. So oh. I said that um, they should have anything regarding their family private, watch who they discuss certain information with, and then make sure they keep anything personal, safe slash private, like if what car they drive, where they live, their phone number, email, anything that could possibly be leaked, keep it private. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. You know, I just I just reused this template, obviously, as I left it some names from last time. And when I was going through and clearing out the answers from previous ones, someone just wrote like, get a bodyguard wall, <laughs> um, which like in some ways is funny, but in other ways we're like, yeah, maybe they should have protection, right? Especially if they're deciding, cases with violent offenders, things along those lines. Um, and again, for those of you who may not have gotten a chance to click on the article personally, um, Judge Roll was one of the people who was with Representative Gabby Giffords the moment, the day morning that she was meeting constituents at just a grocery store and she was shot through the head. He was also shot and he was killed. Um, so she sort of survived on luck and really good medical care. Um, but unfortunately for him, there was no opportunity for that. So anything else anyone else wanted to say about this one? Yeah, Jasmine. I thought that maybe judges shouldn't be assigned to so many cases in the first day. Not only do we have the work judges system, um, uh, how many judges are assigned to a multitude of inmates if they have the process? Right. And some or most of them do not have any representation that they chose themselves. So bias ruling from judges are not uncommon at all. And it becomes problematic. So more judges are assigned to a set number of cases. Maybe we can stop assigning one judge per case or a minimum for a high risk citizen like violent crime or a federal event. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. And you know, one of the things I didn't even talk about <laughs> is that in some jurisdictions, like the judges are so busy that there are actual there are other what they call triers of facts who are sort of appointed. And it's not that they're not qualified, they're just not judges. <laughs> so like you might see a magistrate and they might uh, you know, be the person who decides your case. So you're not even seeing a judge. It's almost like a, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like a good like designation, like a TA or something, I don't know, uh, like a teaching assistant. Um, so yeah, just thinking about like, how do we, give everybody the time and attention their case needs and how do we distribute resources? I think it's a really good, important thing to think about. Alrighty, and then uh, group four, uh, looks like you guys might not have gotten to question five either, so apologies, but if you have any thoughts about uh, how taking precautions, like having a bodyguard, not sharing private information, things along those lines would affect judges psychologically and how might that affect their rulings? I think taking some of those precautions would definitely affect how they made their rulings. Like you probably just like subconsciously be more cautious and like which definitely like then you wouldn't you wouldn't be making your decision based on the law. It would almost I feel like in some cases maybe you should be making it based on your safety. Yeah, no, I think that that makes sense, right? Yeah, I like it. Uh, 
It could be therapeutic to your experience or anybody in any sort of judge position who has to take uh, precautions for their own safety. Well, I feel like catering to the individual. Well, I think like uh, like the, the goal of like the judicial system is to get like objective and like inclusive ideas to make like a uh, biased decision. So obviously, no one is going to bias and stuff. And if you think that like catering to the individual issues. So I think it's going to be beneficial to kind of cater to them and try to get them on some kind of personal level because then you get the agency whether or not the best decision is depending on what you've done. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, Julia. I'm not really sure which question it's going to relate to, but I remember reading something where it might have been in one of my criminal justice classes about how, like, if you look at the, like, police systems or anybody that's like working with those individuals in certain societies, most of the time they don't reflect the society that they're working in. Mm -hmm. And like that can become a very big problem because like, I mean, we see many white police officers working in areas where the population is not white individuals. And I feel like that can cause some type of disparities, obviously, but like it, I feel like your society should be reflected by like your judges and the people in that system just because not only can they relate to you in a different way, but I feel like it it like gives you, I don't want to say comfort, but like it, I feel like that would just better, they should do a better job at making it more. Yeah, more I, think, but. I think you're really getting at something, Julia. Yeah, that like. The people who are in these positions, whether you're part of a police department, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a judge, you're often separated, like purposefully, right? So we can think about um, the case, and I apologize in advance, sort of trigger warning for our folks of color and other folks um, when I talk about this, but the case of uh, the man from Memphis who was beaten to death, and the video was just released, he was beaten he was black and he was beaten by five other black cops, right? And so it's like, there's something about when you get in that system, right? Whatever the training is telling you helps you to see people not as people, right? And that's disturbing in some ways. And then I think the other thing, particularly with lawyers and judges that becomes an issue is the socioeconomic status difference, right? Like most judges, most lawyers are making pretty good money, right? And then most of the people that'll come before them Aren't. I mean, they might see some white collar crime, um, but especially in these like therapeutic jurisprudence cases, you're seeing homeless folks, right? You're seeing folks who are struggling financially. And so, yeah, I mean, this is one of the reasons why um, the idea of a trial by your peers, the idea of a trial by jury came into being because the idea is like your peers will probably be more fair. Now, when we talk later in the semester about jury deliberations and jury selection, We'll see that's not always the case, right? But yeah, I think that there is really something to the fact that like the people who end up in these positions of power and that includes psychologists, right? Within the legal system are often very distanced from the folks they're working with. And that can sometimes lead to a lack of empathy or a lack of understanding. Um, and so it's on those people to educate themselves and they don't always do that, right? Uh, just as we were talking about with domestic violence, right? the vast majority of people won't bother to educate themselves about like those neuronal changes and things like that. And yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. So we finished a little early today. I'm sure no one said about, oh, Sydney, did you have something? Oh, no, oh, Okay, okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't want to miss. If you have something important to say, go for it. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we'll end a couple minutes early today. Thanks for your participation. On Tuesday, we are gonna watch the pilot episode of Dexter and we're gonna use that to analyze psychopathy. So, yeah, 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 the, the OG. <laughs> I, have, I gave up on the original one.